It's affirmed pro-life law, but it is also allowing a state initiative on November's ballot, which if passed could allow unlimited abortion. Once before and then after the end of Roe v. Wade, Florida passed both a 15-week abortion ban and then a six-week heartbeat abortion ban. Both laws were immediately challenged as violating ideals in Florida's constitution. Both laws Monday were upheld in court. At the same time, the court approved for November's ballot, a measure that embraces unlimited loophole abortions and leaves parents in the dark about teen abortion decisions. This is Life News Radio. Persecution around the world has manifested itself through the centuries, but it is worse today than ever before. Aid to the Church in Need and its donors have been there to help since 1947, never abandoning the church or her most vulnerable children. Will you stand up for your faith and accompany our brothers and sisters on their spiritual journey? Visit churchinneed.org. Churchinneed.org. With non-residents coming to Oregon for assisted suicide, those deaths jumped 21% last year. And a tragic story punches holes in the peaceful death myth, as one patient last year took nearly six days to die. Critics say that those with pain, the elderly, disabled, or even the mentally ill are being abandoned to the thought that they might be better off dead. The founder of Abortion Pill Reversal is marking the milestone of 5,000 children alive because of his novel plan. Dr. George Delgado is also hopeful the U.S. Supreme Court will soon ban abortion pills by mail. For pro-life headlines delivered to your email address daily, sign up at lifenews.com. This has been Life News Radio. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network presents Saints and Seasons. On April 3rd, we celebrate the feast of St. Richard of Chichester, Bishop and Confessor. Richard was born to a noble family in Worcestershire around the year 1197 and assisted his older brother in restoring the family's estates while refusing any part of the inheritance. He studied in Oxford, then on the continent, always maintaining a pious poverty. When Richard returned to England, his scholarly reputation was such that he was soon named Chancellor of Oxford and later became Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Canterbury under the Archbishop St. Edmund. When Edmund was banished to France by King Henry III, Richard accompanied his Archbishop and friend, who died while in exile. Returning from France, having been ordained a priest, Richard was made Bishop of Chichester, in opposition to the King's choice. Despite regular struggles with the King as a result, Richard persevered in leading his flock, prioritizing almsgiving and the strict enforcement of ecclesiastical discipline, especially in regard to chastity. Richard died of a fever while preaching a crusade against the Saracens in the year of our Lord 1253, the day after consecrating a chapel dedicated to his friend St. Edmund. Many ensuing miracles ensured Richard's canonization just nine years later. Also honored on this day are St. Pancras of Taormina, St. Vulpian, St. Nicetus the Confessor, St. Luigi Scrosopi, and many other martyrs, confessors, and holy virgins. For more about the saints and seasons of the Catholic Church, visit thestationofthecross.com forward slash saints and seasons. Exorcists generally identify three categories of activities and experiences that open a person to demonic possession. We can think of these categories as doors for demonic attacks on the person. They invite demons in, but they do not always result in an actual demonic possession. There is also demonic oppression and demonic obsession. There's also just hanging on to the sin, right? and not removing yourself from the sin, which happens to be door number one, he tells us. So what are the three categories of activity that can open a person to demonic possession that most exorcists are in agreement upon? Patterns of sin that are not left, that are not departed from, patterns of sin, the occult, and being a victim of trauma. Now that last one kind of sounds harsh because the person's a victim after all, it's not their fault. Well, it's a question of healing though. Are they healed from that trauma? That Sermons for Everyday Living from 6 to 7 a.m. Eastern on the Station of the Cross. This is Joe McLean, and you're listening to the Station of the Cross, proclaiming the fullness of the truth with clarity and charity. Heard around the world on your Android and Apple mobile devices. Go into the world and 
tell every man that you meet, there is a man on the cross. A Catholic take. What you need to know right now. A bold synthesis of inspiration and information. Keeping you up to date on the news and issues from a courageous Catholic perspective. A Catholic Take with Joe McLean starts now. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, today we're going to be talking about that document that's uh, supposed to drop on Monday, the Vatican document on human dignity. It's about to publish. What's going to be inside of it? We're going to find out. We're going to talk to Dr. Anthony Stein from Return to Tradition about the human dignity document that is potentially going to cause waves. I mean, it's interesting because I saw several articles about it and uh, they're saying, hey, it's not going to be so bad. Don't worry about it. It's not going to be so bad. Uh, I know Tragic Burton predicted yesterday that it will be um, sort of more ambiguity. We'll find out what Dr. Anthony Stein feels about it at 30 past the hour. Also on the show at 14, at 14 past the hour, I want to talk about euthanasia, the rise in euthanasia. Just last year, there was a 15% increase in physician-assisted suicide in Belgium. You know, it's on the rise here in the United States as well. I want to share with you an article that I found in sort of like the, the contrast in Easter, a time of great hope, but instead many are dealing with a good time of despair and they're choosing to take their life. Are they making it more popular in the process, it's sort of spreading like a weed, so to speak? So that's coming up at 14 past the hour. Everything we talk about will be shared in the show notes, of course, over at the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT. So please do hang out there. If you can, you get the show notes, you get the email sign up for the insider list, which gets you access to the Telegram group and the live video feed, plus much, much more. Let's pray. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen. Remember, O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided, inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come. Before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O mother of the word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and now your saint of the day. Saint Richard of Chichester, pray for us. Richard was born to a noble family in Worcestershire around the year 1197. When his father died young, the family estate fell into ruin. Richard's older brother offered to give up the inheritance, but Richard refused and instead took over management of the estate to restore much of its former glory while refusing any benefit from it himself. Maintaining a pious poverty, Richard studied in Oxford, then in Paris and Bologna. When he returned to England, his scholarly reputation was such that he was soon named Chancellor of Oxford. Later on, he was made Chancellor of the Archdiocese of Canterbury under the Archbishop St. Edmund, who became a close friend. When Edmund was banished to France by King Henry III after disputes over authority and jurisdiction, Richard accompanied his Archbishop and friend. St. Edmund died in France and was canonized just a few years later. Returning from France having been ordained a priest, Richard was soon made Bishop of Chichester in opposition to the King's choice. Despite regular struggles with the King as a result, Richard persevered in leading his flock, prioritizing almsgiving and the strict enforcement of ecclesiastical discipline, especially in regard to chastity. Richard died of a fever while preaching a crusade against the Saracens in the year of our Lord 1253, the day after consecrating a chapel dedicated to his friend St. Edmund, a chapel which still stands today. Many ensuing miracles ensured Richard's canonization just nine years later. For more about this day and others in the church's calendar, visit thestationofthecross.com slash saints and seasons. St. Richard of Chichester, pray for us. And now your headline news. Daily Wire reports Trump posts bond in New York civil fraud case preventing seizure of his assets. Former President Donald Trump posted the $175 million bond in his New York civil business fraud case on Monday, one week after an appeals court allowed the leading presidential candidate to post a significantly lower bond. Trump had 10 days to come up with the money. 
for a reduced bond, which prevents the state from seizing any of his assets as Trump's legal team appeals Judge Ingoran's decision. The Hill reports Oregon governor signs law recriminalizing drug possession. Oregon Governor Tina Kotick, a Democrat, on Monday signed a law recriminalizing the possession of small amounts of drugs. The law makes a personal use possession a misdemeanor punishable with sentences up to six months in jail. However, it also creates avenues for treatment instead of criminal penalties. In 2021, Oregon became the first state to decriminalize drug possession. However, the state has recently faced a large rise in overdose deaths and had the second highest rate of substance abuse disorder in the United States, according to a 2023 audit report. And Epic Times reports statewide emergency declared in Indiana ahead of solar eclipse. Indiana Governor Eric Holcomb issued a statewide emergency due to a large influx of visitors to his state to view the total solar eclipse on April the 8th. His order noted that the eclipse will pass directly over the state of Indiana, giving everyone an incredible view of this extraordinary event. The order stated that the last time a total solar eclipse passed over Indiana was in 1869. After the event on April the 8th, the next one is not expected for another 75 years. And those, those are your headline news. We'll be covering the total eclipse, I think, tomorrow on the program. Stick around for that. But the gospel comes to us today from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 through 35. That very day, the first day of the week, two of Jesus' disciples were going to a village seven miles from Jerusalem called Emmaus, and they were conversing about all the things that had occurred. And it happened that while they were conversing and debating, Jesus himself drew near and walked with them, but their eyes were prevented from recognizing him. He asked, What are you discussing as you walk along? They stopped, looking downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, said to him in reply, Are you the only visitor in Jerusalem who does not know of the things that have taken place in these days? And he replied, What sort of things? They said to him, The things that happened to Jesus, the Nazarene, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. How our chief priests and rulers both handed him over to a sentence of death and crucified him. But we were hoping that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Besides all this, it is now the third day since this took place. Some of the women from our group, however, have astounded us. They were at the tomb early in the morning and did not find his body. They came back and reported that they had indeed seen a vision of angels who announced that he was alive. Then some of those with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women had described, but him they did not see. And he said to them, Oh, how foolish you are, how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets spoke. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them what referred to him in all the scriptures. As they approached the village to which they were going, he gave the impression that he was going on farther. But they urged him to stay with us, for it is nearly evening and the day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. And it happened that while he was with them at table, he took bread, said the blessing, broke it, and gave it to them. With that, their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, but he vanished from their sight. Then they said to one another, Were not our hearts burning within us while he spoke to us on the way and opened the scriptures to us? So they set out at once and returned to Jerusalem, where they found gathered together the eleven and those with them who were saying, The Lord has truly been raised and has appeared to Simon. Then the two recounted what had taken place on the way and how he was made known to them in the breaking of the bread. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Venerable Bede, St. Bede, would say, They confess him to be a prophet, but say nothing of the Son of God, either not yet perfectly believing or fearful of falling into the hands of of the persecuting Jews, either knowing not who he was 
or concealing the truth which they believed. The Venerable Bede would go on to say, How does that man boast that he is a Christian who neither searches how the scriptures relate to Christ nor desires to attain by suffering to that glory which he hopes to have with Christ? I think the Venerable Bede, St. Bede, is trying to tell us, to you and me, he's challenging us, decide what it is and who it is you believe in right now. Make that decision right now. He resurrected Lazarus from the dead. He healed many people, blindness. He, he healed their leprosy. He forgave their sins. He walked on water. He, he turned water into wine. I mean, how many more miracles do you need before you begin to believe? This is what the, the, the signs were to the apostles of John the Baptist. Go and tell him what you see here. Do you see the... The, the lame walking? Do you see the blind seeing? Do you see your children prophesying? Then who do you believe in exactly? Is Jesus just a prophet to you? A good man saying nice and pious things? Or is he the son of God? And if he's the son of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you and your whole life must change and be reflective of that. But more importantly, when you are pressed by the world, the flesh and the devil, by your friends, your family members, your colleagues, when they press you because of what you believe in, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, will you give account? Will you give testimony? Will you stand as a witness, a martyr, which is what the Greek word means? Will you be a martyr for Christ, which is your confirmation to be a soldier, a martyr for Christ? Will you proudly proclaim that he is God and the whole world must come to believe in him, which is salvation itself? We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. This is Jesuit Father Robert McTagg, your daily host of The Catholic Current. Join me on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern to welcome back Catholic man of letters, Joseph Pierce. We'll be talking about the hero you've never heard of. A great opportunity to listen and learn. So join us, please, on The Catholic Current on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern, coming to you from the Station of the Cross and the iCatholic Radio mobile app. The Station of the Cross Catholic Media Network is dedicated to answering the critical need of access to quality, consistent, professional, and proven Catholic programming. We cannot rely on other media outlets to properly represent our church. Catholic Radio reaches Catholics, non-Catholic Christians, and non-believers alike. As a nonprofit lay organization financially independent of your diocese, our apostolate is listener-supported. The Gospels record many instances of our Lord going off to a secluded place to pray, so we can be sure that finding a quiet place for prayer is vital for us as well. Located in the serene setting of Cranberry, Pennsylvania, the St. Thomas More House of Prayer is the perfect place to deepen your prayer life or to hold a group retreat. The St. Thomas More House of Prayer is a Catholic retreat center whose mission is to pray the Liturgy of the Hours and spread this beautiful prayer of the Church. Book a visit or learn more by going to liturgyofthehours.org or call us at 814-676-1910. That's 814-676-1910. Be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McLean, and it's great to be on with you. Praise be to God. A coming up at 30 past the hour, Dr. Anthony Stein from Return to Tradition YouTube channel is going to be on our show again. We're going to be talking about the forthcoming document on the dignity of the human person coming out on April the 8th, which is Monday, which is the same day as the total eclipse, but there's no connection to it. It's going to be completely fine. Hey, but there is something interesting in that there was a USCCB document that was drafted back in 2018, and the Vatican told them to hold up, pause there, let's just uh, see how this thing goes. And so they never put that document out. Some are speculating that this document's going to have a lot of that same text involved. So we're going to talk to Dr. Stein about that and some of the other articles that we're linking to everything 
over at our website. If you go to thestationofthecross.com forward slash ACT, you can get the show notes at the top of the hour. We put links to everything we talk about there. So do check that out. But there are lots of stories in the news that are of great concern to me, and I'm sure they are to you as well. It turns out that just last year, there was a 15% increase in physician-assisted suicide or euthanasia. 15% uptick across Belgium in 2023. Let that sink in. Here in the United States, just in 2022, according to the stats, again, we're going to link to them in the show notes, around 55% of U.S. respondents stated that they thought doctor-assisted suicide was morally acceptable, while 3% said it depends on the situation. That's pretty interesting that more than half of adults in the United States are okay with physician assisted suicide are you okay with physician assisted suicide i'd love to know maybe uh producer jake can put up a poll this morning so we can get a, a take on how our audience is doing but physician assisted suicide or euthanasia it is on the rise in fact recently in canada they're trying to force catholics to participate catholic doctors catholic phys- uh, nurses catholic institutions to participate in physician assisted suicide it's kind of a problem and then i found this article over at the free press or again we'll link to it in the show notes the headline says i'm 28 and i'm scheduled to die in may 28 years old and scheduled to die in may golly gee whiz what could go wrong what could be the actual problem is chronic you know like a terminal illness possibly Uh, who knows let's find out let's read a little of this to you So you get a sense. Zariah Terbeek, 28 years old, expects to be euthanized in early May. Her plan, she said, is to be cremated. Quote, I did not want to be to be a burden to my partner with having to keep the grave tidy. Close quote. Terbeek texted me going on to say, quote, we have not picked an urn yet, but that will be my new house. Close quote. She added an urn emoji after the word house. Tierbeek, who lives in a little Dutch town near the German border, once had ambitions to become a psychiatrist, but she was never able to muster the will to finish school or to start a career. She said she was hobbled by her depression and autism and borderline personality disorder. She now was tired of living. She was tired of living. Despite, she said, being in love with her boyfriend, a 40-year-old IT programmer, and living in a nice house with their two cats. She recalled her psychiatrist telling her that they had tried everything and that there's, quote, nothing more we can do for you. It's never going to get any better, close quote. Whew. Could you imagine your, the people you go to to help to tell you, hey, it's never going to get any better. Golly gee whiz, what do you think they're pushing for? Hmm. At that point, the article goes on. She said she decided to die. I was always very clear that if it doesn't get better, I can't do this anymore. As if to advertise her hopelessness, Terbeek has a tattoo of a tree of life on her upper left arm, but in reverse. Where the tree of life stands for growth and new beginnings, she texted, my tree is the opposite. It is losing its leaves. It is dying. And once the tree died, the bird flew out of it. I don't see it as my soul leaving, but more as myself being freed from life. Her liberation, as it were, will take place at her home. No music, she said. I will be going on the couch in the living room. She added, the doctor really takes her time. It is not that they will walk in and say, lay down, please. Most of the time, it's a first cup of coffee to settle the nerves and create a soft atmosphere then she asks if i'm ready i will take my place on the couch she will once again ask if i'm sure and she will start the procedure and wish me a good journey or in my case a nice nap because i hate i hate it if people say safe journey i'm not going anywhere the doctor then the doctor will administer a sedative followed by a drug that will stop Terbeek's heart. When she's dead, a euthanasia review committee will evaluate her death to ensure the doctor adhered to a due care criteria. 
and the Dutch government will almost certainly declare that that the life of Zora Terbeek will lawfully have ended. She asked her boyfriend to be with her to the very end. There's, uh, there won't be any funeral, she said. She doesn't have much family. She doesn't think her friends will feel like going. Instead, her boyfriend will scatter her ashes in a nice spot in the woods. They have been chosen together, she said. I'm a little afraid of dying because it's the ultimate unknown. We don't really know what's next. Or is there nothing? That's the scary part, she says. Terbeek is one of the growing number of people across the West choosing to end their lives rather than live in pain, pain that in many cases can be treated. Typically, when we think of people who are considering assisted suicide, we think of people facing terminal illness. But this new group is suffering from other syndromes, depression or anxiety, exacerbated, they say, by economic uncertainty, the climate, social media, and seemingly limitless array of fears and disappointments. Quote, I'm seeing euthanasia as some sort of acceptable option brought to the table by physicians, by psychiatrists, who previously it was the ultimate last resort, said Steph Gorenwood. I have no idea how to say their name properly. We'll keep moving on. A healthcare ethicist at Theological University Campion in the Netherlands. I see the phenomenon especially in people with psychiatric diseases and especially young people with psychiatric disorders where the healthcare professional seems to give up on, the, on them more easily than before. Theo Bior, a healthcare ethicist professor at Protestant Theological University, served for a decade on the Euthanasia Review Board in the Netherlands. Quote, I entered the review committee in 2005 and I was there until 2014, Bior told me. In those years, I saw the Dutch euthanasia practice evolve from death being the last resort to death being a default option, a default option. He resigned. Bior had in mind people like Zora Terbeek, who critics argue have been tacitly encouraged to kill themselves by laws that de uh, destigmatize suicide, a social media culture that glamorizes it. A radical right to die activist who insist we should be free to kill ourselves whenever our lives are complete. They have fallen victim in critics' eyes to, ki to a kind of suicide contagion. And the statistics are showing that as they prepare themselves to die in this way. They think it's like us going to Starbucks, I guess. I want you to let that sink in. Let that ruminate a little bit. We're living in a world where suicide is not only destigmatized, it's now popular, it's now fashionable. Like getting your like getting your uh, your vente peppermint mocha. It's a Starbucks. You can actually craft it. It has smells and and feel a feeling of an atmosphere of of relaxation to it. And I'm sitting here thinking about Bortolo Longo. The young man raised in a Catholic family when his dad died when he was just a young teenager. Now, Bortola was a genius, a well ahead of his peers in, in his intelligence and capability. So he went to university early. What did he find there? He found a fallen away Catholic priest, a man who used to be a priest, but left, became a professor and an atheist, and worse, became an occultist. And he led young Bortola Longo into the occult through seances and rituals. In fact, he would be ordained into this, this dark, demonic world. And he would have a personal demon. We all have personal demons. The demons do try to tempt us. That's true, just like we have a guardian angel. But in this case, this demon would talk to Bortolo, and Bortolo would talk to him as well. And he thought he was receiving secrets, secrets of the universe. He thought he had a, a, a Gnostic knowledge that no one else possessed. Turns out the demon was just trying to get Bortolo to be in despair and commit suicide, pushing him to the brink of utter collapse. He would starve himself, but not fasting like you and I do, say, during the holy season of Lent as we prepare ourselves in mortification and penance for the, for the Easter season. No, instead, Bortolo was trying to destroy his own self at the behest of this demon who wanted nothing more than to see him die in despair and go to hell for all eternity. 
there to be punished by the very demons that he would commune with in his seances and then lead others as well. There is a world that comes after this, and it is eternal, and there are consequences to the choices we make in this life that impact us in the next. The resurrection is a testament to that. And we live in a world where your friends, your family, your neighbors are tempted to a despair that will lead them to this eternal torture, this eternal punishment. Because when you choose to murder yourself, you are committing a mortal sin. To murder someone, thou shalt not kill is the commandment God gave to us. Thou shalt not kill. So abortion or euthanasia, we do not kill. We are not to kill. We may have to defend ourselves sometimes. We may have to commit acts of violence uh, for reasons that are beyond our control. And we are to uh, protect the innocent, defend our loved ones, our family members. That's a different situation. But to choose to kill is a, is a mortal sin. And when you die in a state of mortal sin, you go to hell. So the rise of despair is a plague upon mankind. The Easter resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, defeating death, defeating despair, is the message that you and I must communicate in a dark world. As the time of our end times grows near, this will increase. Is that day to day? Is that day Monday? Is that day 10 years from now? I haven't the slightest clue, but I can tell you this, that I may not last this day. I may get hit by that proverbial bus, and so can you. And so we must resign ourselves as Easter worshipers, as CNN likes to call us, as disciples of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, unlike, say, the disciples on the road to Emmaus and, uh, you know, Cleopas and his partner there, we must decide who the Lord is, and we must resign ourselves to say, he is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he is the God-man, the Son of God, the second person of the Blessed Trinity, and we must proclaim him as a message of hope to those that would despair. What a tragedy to be 28 years old, to have your life ahead of you, and to decide to kill yourself in the last desperate act of murder and vengeance. May God have mercy upon those that would despair that much. And may God allow us to be an, an instrument in the hand of the Holy Ghost to bring hope, a seed of hope in the lives of those that despair around us. Never give up. Never, ever give up. For Christ is risen. Truly, he is risen. And he is hope for all eternity. Let us believe in him. Please join Father Mark Noonan in praying the Litany of Humility. O Jesus, meek and humble of heart, hear me. From the desire of being esteemed, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being loved, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being extolled, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being honored, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being praised, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being preferred to others, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being consulted, deliver me, Jesus. From the desire of being approved, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being humiliated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being despised, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of suffering rebukes, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being calumniated, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being forgotten, Deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being ridiculed, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being wronged, deliver me, Jesus. From the fear of being suspected, deliver me, Jesus. That others may be loved more than I, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be esteemed more than I, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That in the opinion of the world, others may increase and I may decrease, Jesus grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be chosen and I set aside. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be praised and I unnoticed. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may be preferred to me in everything. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. That others may become holier than I, provided that I may become as holy as I should. Jesus, grant me the grace to desire it. Amen.
Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain, and here are your headline news. Breitbart reports North Korea tests missile believed capable of hitting Japan and Guam. The government of South Korea and Japan confirmed yesterday that communist North Korea fired a projectile believed to be carrying a hypersonic warhead and potentially capable of striking the American island of Guam. The missile, identified as an intermediate-range ballistic missile, fell into the East Sea or the Sea of Japan and did not cause any damage. North Korea is believed to have tested three ballistic missiles this year, a year that began with Kim Jong-un saying that it was impossible to reconcile with South Korea. Just the News reports Tesla, uh, their first quarter EV sales have failed to meet analyst expectations. Stocks are falling. Tesla's reported first quarter sales of its electric vehicles fell well below analyst expectations, result in stock prices declining by as much as 5.5 percentage points in early trading. The Austin, Texas company said it delivered 386 plus thousand vehicles worldwide, but that fell short by 9% of the 423% uh, thousand vehicles, rather 423,000 vehicles it sold in the same time last year. That's been a big drop in the first one since 2020. Epic Times supports four killed, 700 injured after massive 7.4 earthquake shakes Taiwan. The 7.4 magnitude quake struck at 7.58 a.m. local time, about 11 miles southwest of the east coast city of Hualien, a depth of around 21 miles, according to the U.S. Geological Survey. It was followed by a 6.5 magnitude aftershock just 13 minutes later. The quake caused damage to 97 buildings, four of which were partially collapsed and killed at least four people, according to the National Fire Agency. Around 77 people were trapped in buildings in Hualien, when several of those buildings sustained heavy damage. Rescue attempts were underway throughout the day, and reports of Chinese Navy warcraft are circling the island right now. And those, those are your headline news. Joining us now is Dr. Anthony Stein from the YouTube channel Return to Tradition. Dr. Stein, happy Easter. Good morning. Thanks for being on with us today. Thanks for having me on again, and happy Easter to you and your audience. The, uh, so a story broke, I think it was yesterday, might have been the day before, but I think people knew it was coming, and that was a document coming out of the DDF and uh, His Eminence Cardinal Fernandez on human dignity. And a lot of people are talking about this, given the backlash of Fiducia Suplicans, Everybody's kind of wondering what to expect here. And then I saw, I think it was the Pillar reported that in 2018, the USCCB actually uh, published, a, they didn't publish, they drafted a document on the very same issues and then sent it to the Vatican for approval. And the Vatican's like, no, hold on, don't worry, we'll cover this. And now they're thinking that some of this, uh, some of that document will be involved in this. So what can we expect? I think that's the biggest question in everybody's mind. What are you expecting out of all of this? Well, Cardinal Fernandez told us that the document will cause less controversy than Fatuccia Supplicans, which a lot of people will breathe a sigh of relief hearing that. I think that's a low bar. It's a very low bar to cause less controversy than something that destroyed ecumenical dialogue between the Eastern Orthodox, the Coptic Church, and the Catholic Church. That's. It would be hard to come up with something as controversial as Fatuccia Supplicans. I am reminded, for some reason, the feeling I get from this, I'm reminded of the declaration about um, St. Joseph that came out a couple of years ago. Do you remember that? There was a mm. document, there was something that they, re they released a thing about St. Joseph that a lot of people breathed a sigh of relief when it was issued, and it sound, it looked like a, at a surface reading very fine and normal. But then when you actually read it, there was a lot of sort of like globalist lingo sprinkled throughout it. And... And then anybody who objected to what was said and that was poo-pooed as being kind of an extremist. I mean, after all, the thing re mm. sounds Catholic, except for the poison pills throughout it. And that's more of what I kind of expect it from this. The document that the Vatican had issued five years or written five years ago had apparently gone through several drafts. And there might be a few things from that time in it. But in the aftermath of Fiducia Supplicans, I the the consistent thing you're seeing for most analysts on this is that you're, you will expect to have the Vatican come down uh, against gender ideology, transgenderism, mm. all that stuff. We've seen Francis say good things about that recently. 
you'll probably have reiterations of some pro-life language, that kind of thing. But it's always the Catholic sounding things that are that are used to uh, kind of obfuscate some of the other statements in there. And so it'll be interesting to read the document when it's issued next Monday on the transferred face to the Annunciation, which is the modus operandi of them. They love to issue their documents on these major feast days. And that's is sort of a traditional thing that popes have done, but especially Marian feast days for Francis. Traditionus mm. Custodus was issued on the feast of Our Lady of Mount Carmel and a couple of very minor Marian feast days that were on older calendars were the, day, were the days that both Fiducius supplicants and two years prior to it, a clarification on Traditionus Custodus were issued in December. Mm. It, the Pillar uh, article and sort of speculating on the text says, quote, um, on sacred orders, the draft explained, and this is that, that uh, draft from 2018, draft explained that a person who has the physical traits of a male who felt himself psychologically to be a woman would not be suited to become a priest and a woman who identified as a male is incapable of validly receiving holy orders. But it seems like there might be a little bit of talking out of both sides of the mouth here when it comes to the transgender ideology. On one side, they want to open a door and a way, and they want to talk about, you know, you can be a godfather, godmother, how, you know, I suppose. Uh, but on the other hand, they want to be able to say, no, you, this, you can't receive the valid sacraments under these circumstances. They they kind of want their cake and eat it too. Do you think it? Oh, I think this was uh, this was our producer. Producer Jake basically made this speculation yesterday. The document will include a lot of gobbledygook like language, and ultimately come down to who knows what. Your interpretation, I guess, is all that's left. I think that's that's a fair assessment, and I think the only thing I would tack onto that is Amoris Laetitia was read and was written in a way you could read anything you wanted to in it. And it was implemented in very different ways in very different dioceses. And then the Argentinians showed up and they had their document, their their implementation, which I'm pretty sure was Fernandez, by the way. Mm. And his was the most radical interpretation possible. And what happened? The Vatican said that was the only interpretation. Don't be surprised if we get something like that from this. Now, interpretation no. of what? Who knows? Who knows? Because I don't know what human dignity even means in a Catholic sense. Especially since the document's the title translates to infinite dignity. Yeah. Joe, I have to ask you, does Catholic theology teach us that human beings possess infinite dignity? Or is that a weird phraseology? It's an absolutely yeah. weird phraseology. It makes you wonder, like, well, that's been part of my problem. Even going back to JP2 is just, you have to, I mean, we just, you know, recognize 19 years since his passing, but... Man, I, I, when we got Benedict the Sixteenth, I was like, finally, you can actually understand in the first reading of, of a document what Benedict is talking mm -hmm. about. With JP two, you had to read it ten times. It, it, we're, we, we're still stuck in this world of sort of gobbledygook language going on for two hundred pages, and you're just like, what? 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 What did they just say? I find this infinite dignity phrase sort of in that camp. It just you scratch your head and you're just trying, you want to understand, you want to give them benefit of the doubt. But now that we're, you know, going on 12 years into this pontificate, you're just like, you throw your hands up almost. Uh, yeah. I, for a lot of us, the benefit of the doubt, that train left the station a long time ago. <laughs> yes, this is why some of us are just hoping we get some just generic stuff that is meaningless because there's also been a lot of just otherwise meaningless documents or things that are really only interesting if you are heavily invested in how uh, Vatican City is governed. You know, those mm -hmm. kinds of documents. Like, I don't find those all that interesting. Um, but other documents that came and went without a lot of attention, though, were things like Core Orans. You familiar with that document? Yeah. 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 It's the one that uh, governed, uh, cha radically changed how religious orders were, were governed. And when it was issued, it didn't make a lot of headway. It didn't make a lot of headlines because it wasn't sensational. But the consequences of that document were catastrophic with Huge. religious orders. Yeah, yeah, so sure it's were. One of these things, I mean, just because it looks innocent at first doesn't mean it's going to be. How much of the, the dubia? Ever written. <laughs> how much of the dubia do you think will play a role in this document? Oh, I don't even know. I th if I would be surprised if uh, there was anything written that was a response to the dubia. That initial dubia is never going to get responded to. I don't think. Mm -hmm. um, and the most recent dubia is not going to get responded to either because people forget, uh, you know, you had Cardinal Burke's first dubia back in 2016. And then you had a 
Dubia submitted about blessings for gay couples and things. And the Vatican issued a response to that, but it was like sort of the mental gymnastics and things for responses for things that should have only been yes or no questions. And so Cardinal Burke and the other dubia, new Dubia Cardinals issued another Dubia written in much plainer language that only that literally said at the end of each question, yes or no will suffice. And that one has never been responded to. And I don't think you're going to get a response either for any of those. Well, I don't know. It's uh, very fascinating to think that they just went through uh, that that uh, pushback on fiduciary supercons, and it was a worldwide pushback. I think we can uh, we can't overstate that enough. It wasn't just African bishops; it was bishops and clergy from all over the world pushback on that. It was a, a very significant thing. You would mm -hmm. think that the Vatican wouldn't want to go through that again. Paul VI never wanted to write another uh, encyclical as a result to Humani Vitae's pushback. Yet this pontificate doesn't seem at all phased by that pushback. Do you see mm -hmm. that as well? I, it's Francis strikes me as much more of a fighter, right? I mean, you see it in the, the rhetoric he uses, how he's willing to push back as much as, as hard as he gives, even though he sometimes will wrap it in a little softer language than his critics will give to him. I don't know about Paul VI, though. I think Paul VI almost looks like he gave up after a while. Mm. Yeah. You know, he had some buyer's remorse for the, uh, for the thing, for the changes in the church that he, that he was responsible for ushering in, tried to dial it back some, but clearly most of the bishops started ignoring him. And I don't know about that with Francis. I, he strikes me as something, he has a very different, I think, approach to these things. What do you think the chances are the next pontificate that, uh, will be someone like a Francis or versus maybe uh, someone who's like liberal theologically, but at the same time doesn't have that fighter sort of backbone that Francis seems to have and stick into his guns and his agenda. What I, I have read and reported on before that the St. Gallen group, if you want to call them that, or their, their successors have been meeting and they've, what they've decided is they want to try to push for a pope who is on the same page as the liberal wing like Francis is, mm. but is easier to control. Oof. Also probably someone a little more charismatic. Like the Francis that undermines his own works whenever he starts talking about rigidity and clericalism and, you know, not wearing grandma's lace and things like that. That undermines his own work when he does that. These bit of the St. Gallen group are going to be trying for a more moderate tone, but still radical kind of pontificate and on the flip side of that is demos the second right which mm. i suspect is cardinal mueller when i read it I, that just screamed that document screamed cardinal mueller to me when i read it you know they 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 want a also a moderate but a much as someone who's actually a moderate not a concert not a traditionalist not a hardline conservative they want a moderate who will listen to a council of cardinals mm. i do i think we're going to get a moderate i think there's a chance we will but the numbers on the of the of for the uh college of cardinals france pope francis has replaced something like 75 percent of them at this point i i don't like the odds even though there probably aren't that many radicals there he is about he announced yesterday or the day before that he's going on a tour in the fall before the next phase of the synod of southeast asia there's a i am likening this to him going on a campaign tour both for there's it's a two prong campaign tour. Part of it is his recent rhetoric about Benedict being his first choice in the 2005 conclave, which I'm very skeptical of. A few other yeah, I want I want to come back to moderate himself. We're, we're at a break. Southeast Asia is a periphery, so you know, yeah, we're, we'll talk about this. We're at a break, but I want to come back with that. <laughs> that was a very interesting comment. It's a brand new book out, interviewing. His Holiness Pope Francis, and, he, and every time there's an interview come out in book form, there's always something. And right now, uh, Pope Francis said that he was used by people to uh, to uh, go against Benedict in the 2005 conclave. Poor Francis was used against Benedict, but Benedict was his choice. That was his candidate of choice, don't you know, Dr. Stein? So we're going to talk about that on the other side of the break and more. Coming up with Dr. Anthony Stein from Return to Tradition, the YouTube channel, which we'll link to in the show notes. But more is coming up next, and I would be very grateful to you, uh, infinitely grateful to you if you would share us with a friend. We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Hello, 
this is Steve Gleason with your one-minute tool for Catholic evangelism. Here's the question for your non-Catholic friend. Which of these is the most difficult for you to objectively believe? Jonah lived in a whale? Moses heard God's voice in a bush? Peter's authoritative declarations would be backed by heaven? Or that Daniel survived the flames of fire? Well, here's your three best friendship tools for Catholic evangelism. Number one, the results. Most difficult was Jonah, then Daniel, then Moses. The easiest was Peter receiving authority to grant forgiveness. Secondly, the early church was tough. You see, that authority granted to Peter could put one out of the church due to sin, and that same authority was installed to bring one back into the church through personal confession. We understand that reconciliation with the church is inseparable from reconciliation with God. And thirdly, our Bibles are filled with promises, but this promise was to Peter, the apostles, and the generational successors of Peter known as the Catholic bishops. So here's an idea. Take a drive down your street, look up at a Catholic church, and just know this for a fact. That priest inside that church was ordained straight down through the lineage of St. Peter. Some atheistic scientists claim we don't need God to explain the universe because science is sufficient to get the job done. But is this true? The answer is no, and here's the reason. Science could never negate the need for God because it can't give an exhaustive explanation of the universe. First, it relies on the inductive method in order to validate its hypotheses. As such, Scientists can never be certain they've discovered every piece of data necessary to give a complete explanation. They must always be open to discovering something new that could alter their current theory. Furthermore, science presupposes an existing universe to observe and explain. Thus, it could never explain why the universe exists in the first place rather than not. Science has explanatory power, but not enough power to negate the need for God. I'm Carlo Broussard with a ready reason for Catholic Answers, catholic.com. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to A Catholic Take, a bold synthesis of information and inspiration. I'm your host, Joe McClain. It's good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Hey, we're talking with Dr. Anthony Stein about the Vatican uh, basically announced that they're going to publish a document on the infinity of, di di I don't know, the human dignity thing, but from, an, I don't know, it's like, where do they get in this language? I don't know. But it's coming out on Monday, on the same day as the solar, total solar eclipse here in the United States, by the way. We're going to be talking about that tomorrow on the show, uh, trying to piece some of those uh, puzzle pieces, connecting the dots. Could we be reading too much into that? Maybe, maybe, but it's also very, very interesting. So more of that tomorrow on the show. There is a uh, there is a poll up right now on our YouTube feed. Do you think physician-assisted suicide should be allowed? Surprisingly, 2% of you said yes. 98% said no. 2% said yes. Uh, very fascinating. We'll maybe talk more about that in the after show. So uh, if you want to if you want to vote or be a part of that, you can go to the station of the cross dot com forward slash ACT. Scroll down to get to the live video player there and you'll see the YouTube icon just underneath. That's a great place to go or Facebook or Twitter or Rumble. We're hanging out live and we'll be hanging out with you at the top of the hour. Dr. Stein, welcome back to the team. Glad to have you back on the show. So right before the break, you brought up something that was fascinating, and this came out just like yesterday, the day before, is that there's yet another interview book coming out with Pope Francis. And every time there's a book that comes out, there's always some interesting something in, this, in these books that makes us all go, what? And uh, he basically was asked about the 2005 conclave, he was asked about his relationship with Benedict XVI while he lived at the Vatican, wore white, had the ring, kept the titles, cardinals visited him, let that sink in. Uh, but it, the interesting thing to me was what he said about the 05 conclave. He was used against Benedict in that conclave, but Benedict was his candidate of choice. What do you make of that? Uh, it conflicts with every single thing we've ever heard from the Cardinal Daniels and their, and their types, yeah. <clears throat> the, everything we've heard was that Cardinal Martini was supposed to be Pope Francis, but he got leukemia and he passed away. But before he did, he recruited somebody to replace him. And that was Jorge Mario Bergoglio, mm. Pope Francis. And they made a very hard push in 2005 because the only time in probably modern history that the likely candidate to succeed a pope that everybody thought was good, the front runner, was the one who was who walked, who was the pope afterwards, and that was 2005 with Benedict. Most people thought that Ratzinger was going to become pope, but it almost didn't happen because of this heavy push by the Saint Gallen Mafia. 
And it's why it's so fascinating that Francis is saying that, he, oh, Benedict was his personal choice and that he was used. It conflicts with everything we've heard about this to the point where a lot of people honestly just don't believe it. I mean, maybe that's how he chooses to remember it, but that's a lot of people just simply do not believe it. Um, he could have voted for Francis or for Benedict in the final ballot just to get the thing over with at that point. Because uh, how many days was that conclave? Do you remember? I don't remember how many days that conclave was. It, was it like wasn't that long, so. really. Yeah, it was a pretty short one. Right. And this comes out on the hot on the heels of Francis announcing that he's not going to change any rules because, uh, on the con of the coming for the coming conclave. I put an asterisk next to that. He qualified mm -hmm. it by thinking saying it's a, it's a it's a at best secondary importance. I put an asterisk next to that because there's a lot of people just openly saying they think Francis is going to pass away soon. I tend to one find that speculation kind of ghoulish, but I also don't uh, think that's even true. I think he's going to be around for a while yet. If he wasn't going to be yeah. around for a while, he wouldn't be planning his trip to Southeast Asia. Mm -hmm. But he, as I was saying, he, he this is all part of a kind of a campaign tour, right? The, he's there are a lot of articles being published by National Catholic Reporter. American Magazine and other kinds of outlets like them, hinting that they believe that Francis should resign, that he should retire early and become a Pope Emeritus. And this is clearly him campaigning against that idea, but also trying to make himself a little more moderate, while also campaigning for essentially, I think, the next for the conclave that will elect a successor. And he's doing that by going to the global south, Vietnam, Indonesia, a few other places like that, but doing that in the fall. And if I was Cardinal Tagle, I would be joining him on as much of that tour as I possibly could. Because um, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Cardinal Tagle was the, considered the front runner yeah. to be Francis II. And then he had a few missteps and he his uh, pop ability kind of tumbled a little bit. But apparently recently he's being seen again as a front runner. Really? And I, yeah, I, I it blows my mind. I, every time I picture Cardinal Tagle, have you, you've seen the video footage where he's at World Youth Day rapping, literally rapping with kids, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to give you, there's a certain dignity that should come with the papal office, and I, I don't know if he's capable of, of maintaining that dignity. It's cringy. That's, Seeing the video footage of Tagle dancing and doing all these shenanigans, right. just trying to impress the young people, I don't know that they're all that impressed. They probably laugh, but it's not that impressive. And it's just, it's cringy to watch. It's its like, it's, are you that cringy? The higher, the higher up the ecclesiastical ladder the person doing it sits, the worse it is, the cringier it is. I, I'm yeah. uncomfortable when I see a priest doing stuff like that. Right. And when I yeah. see, you know, priests, you know, getting up on stage with a guitar in their hands, starting to, you know, play rock music, that makes me uncomfortable. It really does. <laughs> yeah, you know, for I sure. Don't, I don't care what they listen to in their, in their own time, whatever, but, you know. I don't want to see priests talking publicly about, you know, their video game habits and things like that. That's just, there's <laughs> That's a line. So true, yes. And the higher up the ladder you go, the worse it is. And so now you have a cardinal archbishop of the church rapping publicly. That's just mm. with kids. I mean, yeah. You know, there's another article I want to bring up before we run out of time on the radio side here from 1 Peter 5, 1 Peter 5.com. And uh, Bishop Chapu resists Francis ahead of new document. Now, I think that word resists is kind of a strong one in the title of this article, because when you read the article itself or when you go to uh, His Excellency's actual comments, it's resistance, but it's pretty light fare in, overall. He doesn't actually he doesn't actually he doesn't take the kind of strong position that I or you might even take in regards to pushing back or resisting against uh, Francis. But I see him, Cardinal Chapu, or rather uh, Bishop Chapu, as as a sort of a canary in the coal mine. He, he he's not the kind of guy who rocks that boat all that often. He's been very mm -hmm. pro-life. He said a lot of great things during his, during his active ministry days, but now in retirement, you almost never hear from him. What do you make of Bishop Chapu? He'd been silent for a long time. Maybe he would go give a public mass somewhere and say some things, but he, it, he hasn't been a prolific writer. I know because whenever I, I present the writings of any bishop who challenges the status quo in Rome, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I, one of the things that I do regularly. And it was surprising to see something from him. I think you're correct in saying that he would be a canary in the coal mine. I think a lot of the moderate bishops are, are done. 
They're just done with this stuff. And I think Fiducia Supplicants finally was the straw that broke the camel's back. Amoris Laetitia was, was that for a lot of laymen, you know, holy, you know, sacrament of marriage and things being undermined with that document. But Fiducia Supplicants was just too much. And I, it does almost make you wonder, doesn't it? If, uh, I know we know, we know that Demos II is a cardinal. They, well, that's what we know. And if Chaput was was a cardinal, I would almost think he would have written the thing because it's not that flamboyant of a document in the same way that what, what the bishop here in this article was saying was fairly commonsensical, moderate kinds of critiques of things going on. You know, if you're looking for a strident traditionalist bishop, that's not who this bishop is at all. His critiques don't don't have that air about them. They don't have, they don't come close to anything like Archbishop Vigano says. They don't come close to you know, the, in a very peaceful way, the way Bishop Strickland talks about things when he when he chooses to. It's, but it's uh, nonetheless his the things he has to say are very on point and was yeah. surprising to see. I think it's a it's uh, indicative of the time that we find ourselves in, and the, these, as you to your point, sort of these uh, mainstream, middle of the road type of clerics, they're realizing that they can't go they can't go on with this anymore. They can't just keep going on and pretending like there's not a problem. There's a big problem. And these uh, canary in the coal mines are trying to sound the alarm in their subtle way. And we should be paying attention to that. And I think Shapu is definitely in that uh, category. We're going to put links to these articles in the show notes for you over at the stationofthecross.com forward slash ACT, where you can get the show notes. You can sign up to the email list, get the podcast of our show and much, much more. And boy, would we be ever grateful if you'd share us with a friend. That'd be amazing. Tomorrow, we're going to talk about the solar eclipse, Jonah, Nineveh, and all the rest. We'll see you in the after show. God love you. So what did you think of today's show? Let's discuss that right now in the after show. Your take on the after take. Comment, interact live with me and the team. All you need to do is search for one of our live video feeds on Facebook, YouTube, Rumble, Twitter, LinkedIn, and elsewhere. Simply search for The Station of the Cross, Joe McLean, or A Catholic Take. I'm looking forward to seeing you and interacting with you directly. It all starts right now. It's the after show. And we're back. Welcome to the After Show, everyone, and happy Easter Wednesday. Good morning, everybody. Praise be to God. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Strive to be a sta- saint. That's well said. Restore justice. I like that very much so. Thank you, and good morning to you. Mimi Sky, good morning to you. Eileen, Damon, and Troy Lockett, good morning to you. Mike K is here. Praise be to God. Good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Karen, Andy Bashaw, Mateus, Paul, Good morning to you. Trad Jack Burton is over there. James 16897. Good morning to all everybody on the Telegram group. Always love seeing you here. Thanks for hanging out. Night of the Immaculata. Uh, more like a gorilla in the coal mine. A gorilla. Uh, Shapu? You would cl- would you is that Shapu you're referring to, Night of the Immaculata, as uh, the gorilla? You think Shapu is a gorilla? I don't I would not clarify a car or classify him as a gorilla. No way. I don't know. Dr. Stein, what do you think? I think Bishop Chaput, I might be wrong about this. I may be confusing him with another bishop, but I'm pretty sure he's a bishop who is a, he's a, he's an American Indian, isn't he? He's Native American, right? He is, yeah. I live in Oklahoma where all the, where all the local American Indians call themselves American Indians and they find the Native American title funny, but. Do they um, really? Um, That's hilarious. Yeah, they do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I met, I met a deacon a deacon of a, of the local parish who was an American Indian. And I asked him, so what's the proper thing to call? I just want to bother anybody. He's like, Oh yeah, we're American Indians. That's what the government calls us. I'm like, Oh, okay. <laughs> so hold on. Younger, now can you open a can younger, of worms for me there? The younger Is it, ones get to really, upset. the ones who go to like white liberal universities, the ones who really get upset by calling them that, but, but yeah. Okay. But uh, the so, reason I brought, I brought that up is because I'm pretty sure Shapu is a, is a member of the tribe that I'm fr- that from over here. Cause I remember somebody saying mm-hmm. that here, that he was of the yeah. same tribe. Interesting. Now, do they, yeah. so they, okay, American Indian, do they, is it yeah. an acquiescence? Is it like a, a sign of defeat that they just kind of given up, throw in the towel in? That like they, so they just like, oh, that's what the I Americans mean, they are calling us, that's what we're going to go with. I'm pretty sure that they still, uh, their principal identity is with their tribe. So yeah, the main with tribe. With their people. Because yeah. those are the actual. There's two, there's two dominant tribes in my town, uh, three, I guess. I live in Shawnee, Oklahoma. One of them is the absentee Shawnee. But the two yeah. dominant tribes are the Kickapoo and the Citizen Potawatomi. 
citizens of Potawatomi Nation are actually a Catholic tribe, or at least were. Why, why would the entire I, reason? Why would identifying as Na- Native Americans be any better than American Indians, considering that America right. is a exactly. European name for the continent? They, they're yeah, and and it's, and they and Native Americans is a bit of a misnomer anyway, since yeah. they were just the first migratory people to arrive here. Yeah, exactly. If so, our if our accounts yeah. of history are right, so yeah. If you want, what a- else are you going to call? A- them? Accuracy is calling I mean, them Indian by is not right either because they're not Indians. But. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, it's that it, if they're happy with that term, then they're happy with that term. They're, so like, if we right were trying to be thing. truly respectful, we would identify them by their tribe. That'd be the best, most respectful thing we could do is to call them Shawnee or Kickapoo or, you know, until you, what, until you, you deal with, until you meet somebody who is, you know, married to somebody from another tribe and their child is now like, you know, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's got their foot in three worlds, you know, you know, this, yeah, that's you know, right. You know. <laughs> Can we just generalize at that point and call them Plains Indians? I don't. I mean, like, what do you do? Like, there's just only right. so much one, one can do. As opposed to but, fancy Indians? Yes, exactly. Plains versus fancy, 100%. Hey, uh, good morning to you, Alberto. Uh, engines, he says. <laughs> That's a, not a good conversation starter, I imagine, in some, certain parts of Oklahoma. Hey, Kilroy Jones, good morning to you. Miriam, good morning to you. Chesty Marine, good morning to you. Simplify, my friend. Um, uh, uh, what was it? Po- How do you say that, Chesty? Pot- Potow? The Potow tribe? Is that the proper way of saying it? I don't know. I'm probably saying it wrong. Uh, Robert Stevenson, good morning to you. Uh, I- is he a good bishop? Yeah, I believe he was a good bishop or is a good bishop. He's retired, so he has no rural s- responsibility. But at the same time, you know that's been part of my. It's like the it's like the flip side of the same coin. He was he was respected and known to be a good bishop by Philadelphians and others where he came from. I think he was in Colorado before that. Correct, right? I know mm-hmm. a lot of people who say he was amazing bishop. Great, but then he goes off to retirement after having it got leaked by the by who was it leaked by the Vatican or somebody came out and made it known that he wasn't liked by the Vatican or by Francis himself. You know, it's mm-hmm. kind of like, um, I don't like, I'm not looking for WWF. I'm not looking for like a, a like a, a Trump MAGA, you know, uh, rally where we want to see someone get, uh, you know, tackled from the third rope or something like that. But at the same time, like we live in interesting times, your eminence, your excellency, rather, you know, like you need to speak up. And it can't just be in some vague amb- ambiguity. You need to like say truth and let the chips fall where they may. And he, mm-hmm. Shapu went off to retirement, and you don't hear from him. Like now, we're now we're hearing a little bit from him. But when you read the comments, it's not even like it's pretty light fare. It's actually not even all that harsh. So well, that's the, and that's the other thing. Here's the other thing about this. Like you ever noticed that all the bishops who who issue statements, like ninety percent of them are retired. Yeah. That most of the one active ones won't do it. So this is why one of the reasons I have such respect for Bishop Strickland, or not Strickland, mm-hmm. but a Bishop Schneider, is because Schneider is an auxiliary bishop. He's more vulnerable than a normal bishop. He will yeah. never get promoted. There's never. a chance that you'll get a good pope who will refuse to promote him because he spoke against the previous one, unless you get a pope who declares Francis an anti-pope, which a lot of people think is inevitable. Prob- I, I don't know. That seems like it, that, that, that's the nuclear option, right? So you're probably not going to see that. And so Schneider will probably be the auxiliary bishop of Estonia until a, until his ordinary is replaced, retires and is replaced. And, and who knows what, what he has to deal with at that time. Uh, The same with uh, like Eleganti and Mustertz, you know, in Europe, they're just, they're assistant bishops. They don't have, they have a lot to lose. They're the ones that I have the most respect for. And they're also the ones who never get promoted. Yeah. Hey, Becca, good morning to you. Uh, Becca, Ned's kid. I like that in parentheses, Ned's kid. I uh, got to see the arm of St. Jude. That's super cool. Praise be to God. Um, Got to go make sure you go to the Mass and listen to Father Father Carlos. Did, he's a great speaker. I'm going to give it to him. Praise be to God. I've known Father Carlos since he was Deacon Carlos. He was attached to the Charismatic Center here in Houston many years ago. And he had a fantastic reputation of going to the uh, abortion mill, which is the largest in America, by the way, in this hemisphere. The largest one is right here in, in Houston, Texas. And he was always over there because the Charismatic Center is right across the street where the Companions of the Cross uh, managed that place. 
and uh, he, as he was finishing his formation, he would he was always go to the abortion mill to pray. And um, so, is that what's still open though? I thought Texas outlawed the procedure. They did, but it's still open now. So I want to. What are they you, doing there? Is the question. You you're in, you're in Houston. This this came across my news desk like minutes before we went live to, together today. Uh, apparently, there's a rumor that in uh, Texas and a couple other places, a total of three million ballots have already been filled out without signatures on them. I wouldn't be surprised, <laughs> but I haven't heard that. There's like that. The, the, one of the things they're going to try to do is flip Texas blue that way. Oh, for, it, the through, pressure. Uh, the the totally game is on. And totally yeah. Do you think your governor is going to do anything on that? Like he's going to do any election integrity stuff to make sure that whatever happens, <sighs> happens legitimately? I think at the end of the day, President of the United States, governor of Texas, governor of any state, it's, it's, there's, there's things they can do, executive orders, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. But at the end of the day, they have to, they have to make sure their base is happy. They have to make sure their donors are satisfied. And then, of course, then it's after that, I find that it's mostly just PR work, right? They say big things. They, they, they put on a big show because that's that helps with the other goals of making your base happy or satisfying your donors, mm -hmm. you know, issuing these executive orders or whatever. But the, the their their ability to actually kind of get stuff done, I find it is incredibly limited. Actually, you know, so you could own the White House, you can even own Congress if you really want to, and you're still not going to advance the ball quite as far as you think you are going to do in the campaign promises. And I find that's true with Governor Greg Abbott. He's a decent man, of course, but, you know, he's a politician. So he's a politician totally sold out for his party, not necessarily for his Catholic faith. So, you know, let the chips fall where they may, right? Um, he's obviously better than some of the alternatives. But here's the reality in the state of Texas. The pressure is huge here to go blue. I mean, this state used to be blue. It was a purple and blue state for a long time. Uh, Texas Democrats. Oklahoma. Yeah, Texas Democrats, the Southern Democrats. That was a thing. Uh, they hated the Republicans because the Republicans represented abolitionism and uh, anti-Southern cause-ism out of the American uh, conflict between the states. So here we are living the repercussions and the consequences of the American Civil War. Still, today, that's what we're seeing. So in this state, Huge solar dollars, huge money from these non uh, these non government GMO these uh, you know five hundred one c three non government organizations are in the biggest counties in Texas Harris you know a Bear Austin um, and uh, the counties around Dallas they are spending huge bucks to get the voters out to flip the state blue for the next time which is no surprise then that fanning the flame of massive illegal immigration is being concentrated in states like Texas or in states like uh, Florida, for instance, and, and others. So there, mm -hmm. I mean, we've, there's a story out right today that uh, they're flying hundreds of thousands of, of illegal immigrants into the United States, into the, into Texas and, and the some similar, similar states right now to try to flip these states. And mm -hmm. It's they, a, they're, they are they are nakedly working on a one party permanent state in this country. That's yeah, they are. so it sounds that's like, why it sounds I say like a conspiracy theory, but it's true. it wouldn't surprise me in the least to find out that they have already pre set up some ballots. What will Gra Governor Abbott do? I think he's going to do what uh, someone who's trained to operate within that political system is going to do, and I don't think he's going to do any more. Right. So, like, look, take the border for instance. Governor Greg Abbott sent the troops down there and razor wire. Okay, great. Why didn't that happen three years ago? When after Trump left and Biden took immigration skyrocketed. I mean, like, like a, like a, a chart of Biden's progress on election night kind of scale, just vertical takeoff F 22 Raptor, you know, starship Tesla X rocket ship type of graph. Just, crazy insane i mean overnight immigration exploded in the state of texas illegal immigration exploded in the state of texas did he send the national guard for that nope he didn't well he was doing something he was trying but i wonder if it was a if it's a day late and a dollar short number one number two it's not as though the razor wire extends throughout the entire border of texas 
It doesn't. It's just bits mm-hmm. and pieces of it, especially where the reporters are. <laughs> so, I mean, it's a good step in the right direction, but somehow it feels a little uh, soft as well. It feels a little like um, PR. A little feels a little PR for my for my liking. So, he's a mixed bag. Governor Greg Abbott is the answer. Oh yeah, and who I, knows what he most- will do. A lot of the, he's not high on anybody's list as best governors in the country. They're just surprising he's taking the stands that he has taken. Well, um, I'm just maybe, curious. Maybe, I'm just curious because let's let's give a benefit of the doubt. Maybe maybe he's thinking, man, I I, I got to do more. Like I thought I could, you know, I think I thought I could manage this. I can't. It's out of control. We got to do some things. Let's sit in the national guard. Maybe that's the benefit of the doubt. Maybe I don't know. Yeah, I feel like I he could have made those decisions because- sooner. Because uh, this feels like a bloodbath election. It really does. And I'm a, I mean, I'm a political scientist by training. It looks like a bloodbath election. It really does. And I don't mean yeah. that in a, in a whip people up, who scaremongering the B, double B word. I mean, like, this, this looks like one of those. It reminds me of uh, 2010. If you remember mm. the 2010 election where the Democrats, like, got just crushed that year. And it reminds me of just, well, reading about, like, some of, like, the, the Reagan elections. That's how that's how it kind of reminds me of just the tone out there. But who knows? We live in insane times also. And I'm not Will even a we fan see of the, the flip guy. side to that, though? OK, so if Texas, if the pressure's on in Texas and Florida and places like that, you know, these battleground states, Ohio or what have you, will we see a reverse of sorts in places like Wisconsin or California or your home state of Oregon? Will we, I no, mean, Oregon, the, didn't the governor in Oregon just uh, re- reverse the whole, uh, you know, personal use of, of drugs uh, law there because of the high rate of overdoses? She's like, well, maybe we need to yeah. reverse this thing. You know, so but will we see a, a reverse in those have, states? They have, an insti- they have institutional measures to make sure that doesn't happen. The um, it, Oregon was the, like one of the first states in the country to vote by mail. And weirdly enough, as soon as they implemented that, it became a one-party state. More and more so as time went on, as if they were fine-tuning their operation. Uh, I I don't see a scenario where California flips, short of some sort of catastrophe that changes the <laughs> that changes the balance of power geographically in that state. So I I I don't know. We're we're heading toward we're heading towards the, either the ability to have to, to to make it so elections have their normal outcome, whatever they are based on the whims of things or a permanent one party thing. That's where we're heading. Yeah. And yeah. I, I know that sounds apocalyptic and such, but eh, you know how it, <laughs> it is. is. It is what you it know, is. All, all, empires, <laughs> all empires crash and burn at some point. And that's true. And, look, yeah. Do you really think that Texas went blue this time? Anybody would believe it. Like anybody would believe it. Nobody. Okay. I, okay. Hold on. I'm going to push back on that for a second. Do I think Texas can go blue and people believe it? Yes. Why do I think that? I don't know because most Amer- most Americans most Americans want a good time. They want a cold beer and a country uh, a country jam that sounds a lot like hip hop. I mean, they want the WWF. They want the ringside seat. Uh, they, that's what America wants. That's their bar, and because that's their bar, they're going to get what they deserve. So I don't think you have to cheat all that much to get America uh, to get the America that they're really wanting. I mean, that's the I think that's the reality. Most right. conservative I mean, other, I mean, Americans are buying red heifers and sending them over to Israel to offer as animal sacrifices. I mean, like well, yeah, Trump's not offering Trump's not offering an alternative to that though. So that's the other thing. Like, I'm not like I'm not big on the other guy because, you know. I, I like the standard of living when he was running things. <laughs> but, well, yeah, there's good I, things I to be said, I, sure. I don't. I don't miss the political circus, though. Not that it's gotten any better. So it's, it's, it's not. It, yeah. It's a three ring circus, and we're just focusing on a different one of the rings right now. Right. right? Like the last time, we were, it was. It's just. Yeah. Yeah. I know some people are like. How can you not love the guy? I'm like, uh. Well, the, you know, I, I got reasons the for moral, not loving it's him. Not even the morality stuff. Like I, I always joked when I was younger that I wanted to know what it would. It'd have been interesting to be alive to see what Nixon and Lyndon Johnson was like. And now, we, and then we got to experience both of them wrapped up in one guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, but Joe, he's better than the alternative. Yes, I agree. But so is my dog. I mean, it's not a standard. <laughs> you know, it's oh, not a standard. 
he doesn't That's want right. you know unfettered murder of children congratulations yeah you know? exactly. i mean like he, he, he thinks maybe we, he thinks maybe we should not have a border that actually is functional Congre oh great that's how perhaps, far this country has yeah. gotten there's, right there's that's no my point debates anymore our bar is so low that we'll just accept anything that's a, that's at or above that bar but people we deserve better you know and as catholics that bar needs to be raised high and uh, it is not the standard is just too low and that's my that's part of my problem by the way john welcome john cruz welcome back glad to see you here praise be to god he says we are not pulling ourselves out of this the train left the station humility prayer fasting almsgiving is the only answer i do agree with you there I do agree. I think the, with, I agree think, with you there. I think our out for that is doing all those things in preparation for when our idiot rulers get their nuclear war that they seem so hell bent on getting. So hell bent on getting, yeah. Andrea, good it, morning it, it, to it, you. Kilroy Jones, good morning to you. Helen, good morning to you. Praise be to God. Restore justice. Trump has been the best for Catholic moral teaching than any president we've had. Better don't exist. Hmm. Well. I'm going to disagree with you there uh, as far as better don't exist part. Now, has he been the best so far? There could be an argument for that for sure. I used to think uh, I used to, I used to like uh, George W. Um, but I don't like him now. I can be honest with you there. I definitely don't like him or his daddy, you know, even Ronald Reagan hand issues. Everyone's going to have issues. Perfection. You're not going to find, but as a Catholic, uh, I see the whole world through the Catholic lens. Uh, unlike Donald Trump, who doesn't see the world through the Catholic lens, who mm -hmm. supports gay marriage and, and homosexual gender I ideologies, who has compromised on the pro-life issues. But that doesn't mean he hasn't done things that aren't good. He, there's some things that I think were very good, like, for instance, economic policy, or even some of his foreign, foreign policies were really good as compared to, like, say, the current occupant of the White House, Obama, I meant, oh, excuse me, that was that a Freudian slip? I meant Biden. I really did. Um, but nonetheless, uh, that doesn't mean that he is a good enough choice. He isn't a good enough choice. We deserve better and we ought to strive for better. And we ought to stop playing nice with the home team just because we like that one better than the other. We, we are neither, we are, I mean, we, we don't, we don't really find a good fit in either political parties that are offered to us in this country. And I'm going to be having a conversation with somebody about that. I think it's next week. Um, I think that ought to be very fascinating conversation. A Catholic politician's coming on next week to sort of have that conversation. Right. I mean, like uh, the I, other guy's got my vote because he doesn't want to wage war on me and my family and on the church, which for now is the best I can hope for out of a political candidate. And maybe yeah, I the mean, economy won't, won't yeah, be terrible under the guy. Don't get me wrong. You got to cast the best vote based on our Catholic faith, our, our moral compass, and the options you're presented. I'm not suggesting otherwise, but what I'm saying is we can do that while at the same time saying this choice sucks. These choices you have given me are terrible ones. That's what we and need I to be saying. This, I would have told you this too, six months ago, eight months ago, when we all know who all the candidates were. I didn't really care for much of any of them. Uh, I was very happy to see uh, uh, whatever her name was. <laughs> The woman who was running against him without any hope. I was glad to see her lose because I have vowed to never vote for a warmonger ever again, to ever let it happen again. Yeah. I'm never going to, you know, if George W. Bush again showed up, I would not vote for him because no. anybody who's that keen on going, getting the United States into some sort of international conflict, I'm really yeah. good without supporting that person. Yeah, totally. Absolutely. <laughs> um, That's you know, the feature about Trump. He was an isolationist. I love that about Trump. You know, he figured yeah. out that trade and and frankly, bribes are a much better way to conduct international policy than than, uh, you know, threatening to carpet bomb a country <laughs> yeah, while still exactly. being willing to drop bombs on terrorists. So I'm like, OK, <laughs> you know, yeah, 100 you percent. Know. Like we're going to be we're going to do all these trade deals and we're still going to classify them as enemies. And, you know, it's just like this talking out of both sides of our mouth and this sort of schizophrenic policy making between uh, friends and foes. It just. It's it, I, you feel like you're a pawn in someone else's game. You feel totally manipulated mm -hmm. and you don't know what to believe or not to believe. I hate that feeling. It is like a pet peeve of mine. So uh, anybody who falls into that category, is just like, golly, Jewish people, I'm done with you. Uh, and then George W. is totally in that category. The Clintons, of course, the Obamas, the Bidens, you know, um, all of them. 
just they're in that same same category. Not much not much changes over the past 20 years of politics or more, 30, 40 plus years of politics, Democrat or Republican. What what actually changes? What, you know, not a lot, to be honest. Not oh, a lot. Hey, 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 hold on. We got a guy who ran on hope and change. And boy, did he hope change the change. country. Did he? He, he, he ripped the, he ripped the Band-Aid off the race relations of this country. and He uh, sure did. And he, 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 he lit the bonfires up. You know, we wouldn't he have got the summer of love without – Without that, he lit, he lit the bonfire. They went and got a fan and plugged it in it just a, to kind of make sure it got. It was juicy. a mostly peaceful presidency, right? It was most, yes, mostly, 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 mostly peaceful. peaceful. Yeah, he, for he sure. Was wedding, he was also the wedding, the we, the wedding air striker in chief too. <laughs> That's so true. My, the Open drone change. killer. Hey, by the way, Sci-Fi Mike is on the team. Not that you're also a drone killer, Sci-Fi. I'm not making that correlation. I'm just, I'm just transitioning. Sci-Fi Mike, good morning to you, James sixteen eight nine seven over on the Rumbles. Gus DMH, Catholic Courage today. Good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, Catholic Courage today says, if Francis admits to being used in the election of Benedict, then he's admitting to wrongdoing during the conclaves. It isn't that special. Yes, it is. That's not the first. That's not the. That's not the first one to do it, though. Cardinal Daniels admitted yeah. to doing wrongdoing during a conclave. McCarrick. And it didn't... McCarrick. McCarrick made public the, speeches uh, that are on video, saying I mean, the same the, thing. People always get shocked whenever you mention the possibility that a future pope may declare Francis an anti-pope. And if you mm. ever want to find one who does it on just purely technical grounds, they could use John Paul II's declarations on a uh, on how conclaves are run. But you then run into a massive problem when you do that. Mm -hmm. Which is, you know, people have this belief that the Holy Spirit comes down during the conclave and lands on the person who's going to be the Pope. Like, they have this weird idea about this stuff, not knowing that it's been a political process for centuries, if not millennia. The most famous yeah. example of this was the conclave that gave us Pius X. Mm -hmm. Pius X wasn't the first choice there. They elected a modernist. And yeah. the Holy Roman Emperor exercised the imperial veto. And forced them to uh, choose somebody else. And uh, you got Pius X out of it, whose first act was to get rid of the imperial veto. <laughs> so I'm just telling you, you know, the, the idea that the Holy Spirit guides conclaves, here, the cardinals there yeah. can go to Mass and yeah. prayerfully ask for the intervention, the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And I'm sure some of them do. I just don't see a lot of evidence that the, whole, the Holy Spirit's one been guiding the church on who's the Pope for a while. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey, Lori, good morning, good morning to you. Morning. Jane, good morning to you. Start a Catholic party, Jane says. You know, Jane, I was very interested when Taylor Marshall said he was going to run for office. I reached out to him. I tried to get him to uh, sit down with me. I was going to drive up there and rent a hotel room and then do like a Tucker Carlson, Vladimir Putin style interview with him. We were talking about it back and forth, and then he stopped responding to me, so that that didn't go well. But uh, I, I didn't care. I, he had no ob. He was not never going to win. But that wasn't my point. I wanted to talk about what would that look like? What would a would a truly sold out trad Catholic policy platform look like in a presidential campaign? That's fascinating to me. Um, and so I wanted to have that conversation. I thought it was still a good conversation to have, even when he said he was, you know, never really going to launch. He wasn't he decided he wasn't gonna launch that that campaign because he didn't have the mm -hmm. the real uh potential for success right and i thought that was a responsible thing to do don't raise money and take people's money if you really don't ever have a shot at winning i think that would be unethical and he also thought that but that's part of the reason why i got this guy coming on next week this guy it's from the pacific northwest he's from washington state his name is paul and he seems to be a sold out catholic like truly on board the team and so I've got him on the. I've got him coming on next week to kind of have that similar conversation. What I, I does somebody that who's been look e like? I have have somebody emailing me who's saying that they're a U.S. Senate candidate. That's a Catholic. Yeah, a traditional that's this Catholic guy running. Okay, this this guy. His name is Paul. Um, now I, I I don't know anything about him or like or necessarily about like truly much about his background or whatever. But when you when you look at the way this man talks publicly. Mm -hmm. He talks like a sold out Catholic. He talks like he talks like somebody who who uh, who is not afraid to to see the whole world through their Catholic lens. And he's running for U.S. Senate from Washington State. Paul uh, Gisick is his name, and uh, he's a former Marine, so no bias there. Semper Fi. But he's going to be on the team next week. Next, uh, what day is this? Uh, this is going to be on Tuesday. He's on Tuesday. 
the, the ninth, the day after the eclipse. So if we're all still here on the day after the eclipse, we're going to have that conversation, Jane. What would that look like? I, however, will never run. I will not accept. If elected, I will run from you. I never want to serve in public office. I don't think that's the answer. I want to uh, to fan the flame of the bishops getting off the fence and deciding to evangelize every single soul and and uh, let the chips fall where they may. That that's that's the effort that I want to put in. I don't feel that running for public office is a viable solution to to uh, uh, changing the world. Why don't I feel that? Because should like uh, Colleen, I think you pointed out that you thought Donald Trump is not necessarily for abortion. I don't think he is for abortion. I don't. I don't think he's for abortion necessarily either. But I also you don't believe be a special we should... kind of evil to be. You have to be a special kind of evil to be for abortion. Some people are but, very openly about it that way. I don't he think we should compromise. I don't believe we yeah. should compromise, and every single politician will compromise on the on on something because you can't get anything done unless you compromise. Whereas my argument is, as Catholics, as sold out Catholics. You should never compromise on those things. Nope, sorry. Zero abortions. Zero. Not some. Zero. Zero abortions. Uh, nope, sorry. Marriage between a man and a woman. No exceptions to the rule. It just It's a man and a woman, and that's it. And no divorce on demand either. Sorry. Nope. Can't do it. We're, n- we're not about that. Nope. No, no euthanasia. No IVF. No, no contraception. Absolutely not. And no, we don't carpet bomb people or send drones into foreign countries that we we shouldn't be be into places. We shouldn't send our special forces troops behind behind, uh, you know, someone else's sovereign territory just because we want to, because it behooves our political interests. Whose political interests exactly? D- does your vote get to decide who runs the intelligence uh, agencies of our country? Nope, it doesn't. You don't get to change what the CIA, the uh the NSA or any of these other intelligence agencies do or don't do with your donor, with your tax dollars, uh, just because you voted for so-and-so for president, Congress, or what have you, like we should not be compromising on these things, but we do. And that's politics, which is why I'm like, it's not going to solve any of the problems. I wonder if there's a system of government that's less reliant on compromise. (laughs) Hmm. Jake, Jake, I don't, what do you No, It couldn't be. Are you couldn't be one. You're not trying to um I kind of feel like I know what you're doing there. I feel like smell that? It's got the odor of monarchy to it. Shh. It's a dirty word, Joe. You can't say that word here in America. <clears throat> America. I you know, can't by the way, who America. speaking of which, so I don't do you guys who anybody here read Timothy Gordon's book on on um the founding fathers of America stealing from the Catholic Church? Have you I ever, very, you, I I respectfully, vehemently disagree with that assessment. I wrote my doctoral. I wrote my master's. I wrote my I wrote my, ma- I, mo- I wrote my master's thesis on uh, the philosophy of Thomas Jefferson. Okay, and how it could be a road forward for like restoring some sanity to the U.S. I wrote this like fifteen years yeah. ago or something now, but yeah, um, the anti-Catholic hate <laughs> drips from their writings. Yo, you read the founding sure. fathers. Yeah, they they don't like Catholics at no. all. No, no. Well, Timothy to makes that point in his book. He makes that same point that they hate that they sure. they they were enemies of the church, but they stole natural law from the church to Where make did the it church to, get the natural law, law natural law philosophy from. The church got it from Aristotle and Socrates. He makes that point Plato too. And Cicero. He, he wasn't taking it. They weren't taking it from the Catholic Church. They were taking it. We, the Church and the Founding Fathers took it from the same secular sources, same pagan sources, because those were those ideas were conformed to natural law. Any idiot who has a high front, high functioning, you know, intellect can look at you know Cicero and Plato and the rest of them and go, these guys had some good ideas. Maybe we should try to implement these. This will, this will create a much more stable society than simply, um, you know, Protestant monarchy could ever do is yeah the history of england is pretty boring until you get to the reformation then it gets then it gets very colorful afterwards <laughs> you know mm, I, I don't know about that there's a lot of interesting pre well sure but, but, but i'm I kind mean, of a, like, i'm a i'm a bit of a anglophile in that way so well sure but i mean the most a lot, a lot of the most interesting figures and the most bloodthirsty ones oh yes well yeah you know, the, 
chill factor under the eighth. Sure, you you want to, you want to, if stuff, I had to choose yeah, between yeah. to, to live as just a normal person and not have to worry in, in, in a period of English history, decide which, who am I less likely to get murdered by my king living under? It's going to be before Henry the eighth. Oh, yeah. Without question. Oh, certainly. <laughs> without mm. question. It was, I mean, England was Mary's dowry. <laughs> uh, even, even with barons fighting each other and conflicting with the king or whatever, but mm-hmm. it was yeah, just, you know, the War of the Roses and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. exactly. There was that stuff, but. We, uh, hey, Junior Barra, Don Paddock, Patty, Rachel Jordan, good morning to you. Mimi, good morning to you. Linda is on the team. Good morning to you. Praise be to God. Glad you're here today. Lori, good morning to you. Praise be to Jesus. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, uh, the Lost Creole. Joe sounds like Franco. But Franco's a complicated guy, isn't he, Franco? The dictator of Spain. Hmm, is he that I'm still, complicated I, compared to modern politicians? He's complicated. I'm, he's, he, he, I don't like the, I don't know. I mean, so many, like half of the people you meet, they're like, oh, we love Franco. And the other half are like, no, nah, Franco, no thanks. But I think Father Murr said it best. It comes down to which side of the Spanish Civil War persecuted your friends and family. And then, then, then you make your choices based on that. And the real question is, because mm-hmm. Franco did send... Uh, did send Spaniards to fight for Hitler, but he just required that they fight the Russians on the Russian front. Mm-hmm. They did, he didn't want them on the other front. Yeah. But he did, in fact, send them to train with the Nazis and fight alongside Nazis in the Second World War. He And the question is, Deal, did he allow the rat lines through Spain so that Nazis could escape Europe? As some, with the help of prelates in the church? There's a great, I mean, there's a great book called Hitler Stopped by Franco. That I recommend. It's written by a couple who went to Spain to write an yeah. anti-Franco book, mm-hmm. and they did tons of research and ended up writing a pro-Franco. Who, who book. are these people? So I who forget. Are, these I forget are they alive today? Uh, they might be. They're. Uh, could we, could we a... track them down? Maybe get them on the show. That'd be kind of fascinating, be actually. <laughs> but, uh, it's. I don't know. I I, I want to play devil's advocate here. Mm-hmm. If you are mm-hmm. a person of con- with con- with a conscience, and you're a Catholic who believes that people should have a fair shake in a trial and not necessarily be, you know executed mercilessly even if they even if they were part of a regime that did evil things and you were in a position to let some people who were we'll say complicit on the kind of low level we're talking you know stormtroopers and that kind of stuff maybe go start a new life in argentina somewhere by getting through a country or they go to nuremberg where they but there's only one outcome you go to nuremberg those were let's not be let's not lie to ourselves nuremberg the the outcome of those trials was determined from the Mm get-go right it's easy when to talk about the kind of people, the high profile people who are on trial, you know, you know I'm not going to get a lot of sympathy for, uh, you know, Mengele, <laughs> right. Or any of the rest of those guys. Yeah. But a lot of other people who may be in the, uh, in the sort of the international law framework that was developed after the war would have probably just gone to prison for the rest of their lives, ended up going to, you know, gas chambers themselves or whatever. Mm-hmm. Do you, it's at least you can understand why somebody might make the decision to let some of these guys go to Argentina, to take their chances in Morocco, or Argentina and wherever else they tried to go. Mm. It's a moral decision. I, I understand why some of those guys made mm-hmm. not saying, you know, yay Hitler or whatever. I'm sure there are some sure. people who would like to snip this audio and <laughs> make it sound like that. Yeah. But... <laughs> well, it's an interesting topic to say the least. So it'd be fascinating. I put the, uh, it, it looks like it looks like at least one of the authors passed away a few years back. It's it's okay. It's not send a brand book new anyway. book. It's a little older book, but yeah, I'll find the link. Yeah, that'd be interesting. Mm-hmm. I, I, I am, you know, is Fra- was Franco the best choice because there's a weak monarchy now? Like uh, he was strong when the monarchy was weak, and the, you know, and well, tried that's, to find that's what he a, did. There, there was yeah. so much infighting on the anti-communist sides because you had your your different varieties of your different flavors of monarchists. You had um, just straight up, you know, uh, uh, people who wanted to imitate Italian fascism. You had all mm. these different factors and they were all infighting and there was no resistant, no organized resistance to, you know, the people who are digging up the bodies of nuns and, and shooting them up and desecrating them and executing priests. And Franco is the one who said, Okay, you all have to follow me because no one else is getting this done, and let's get the communists out of here. And that's what he did. And you know, hmm, hmm, I don't know. I'm gonna chew on that. I may well look at that book. And I, we'll yeah, see. It's, I mean, because the <clears throat> ideal would be to have you know to restore a, a a more explicitly Catholic form of government, and 
so on, but no one was getting the job done at the time, and that's why he stepped up, which, you know, is is at least admirable in that sense of, like, sometimes you just got to get the job done and stop people from murdering priests and digging up the bodies of nuns. Yeah, yeah but playing both sides feels very, hmm, it feels very... Is it hmm. is it really playing, playing both sides, sides to preserve the peace yes, in your country? Yes, he's playing both sides. He's playing to Hitler so Hitler doesn't, you know, turn on him. So and Mussolini, think, think and then, then he's playing the other side, too. It feels like he's playing both sides. You don't send to, to a division to save the you lives send, of his countrymen and preserve the pe- the people that he's responsible for. So, you, so that, that he, that's the choice you would make. You would send your your sons, your brothers, to go fight for Hitler against communists and, as a way of so placating him, so that so that that Spain know, is safe. I don't know. I, I think it's both sides. I certainly don't think he should have done that. I think that is kind of like uh, well, maybe it's the. It's hard, you know, backseat quarterbacking, right? You know, I haven't walked a mile in his shoes. There's no question in my mind. I can't begin to fathom the complexity of his situation. At the time, Spain had whatever. just ended However, the Civil War. However, so. he definitely feels like he's playing both sides and, you know, looking to keep all of his options open as, po- as much as he possibly can. And maybe we're rationalizing that to say, but it's to save the country. And, you know, maybe there's something to that. I don't know. I've not been in that situation. I haven't dealt with those things, but it definitely feels... Because like he is playing both sides, kind of like Francis does. He kind of likes to play both sides. Say one thing, do another. Say another thing, do the other. You know, it's like that kind of thing. Was and he, I don't, was he, I don't respect sent, that. But was Franco. he sending? Was he sending men to go kill Catholics? I don't know. He was sending. He was sending men to, during he, World War II. He was sending men. He was sending men to go fight communists because he was like, okay, let me try and and here's. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'll help you. I'll help you. And meanwhile, so, he's not <laughs> siding with them, and he's not, and he's not so, allowing Hitler to control. What the if they killed? What if they didn't? What if they killed not Catholics, but they killed? You know. Uh, well, what if the Allies, Russian Orthodox? Well, what if the is, Allies? Is that okay? What if the Allies sent tons and tons of supplies for years to a communist regime that murdered millions? Oh wait, we did. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> so just like, but, but that doesn't that saying, doesn't change like, anything. But that does. I don't I don't like our American policy anyway. Yeah. But uh, that doesn't change what Franco did or didn't do is right or wrong. Just because America has done bad things. Yeah. But what I'm saying is that, is that Franco. Hitler, uh, <clears throat> Hitler, Hitler, Franco was prioritizing, you know, tr- helping Spain recover in in as much peace as they could get after having. Yeah, but there's an the old principle that says the ends don't justify the means. So just because mm-hmm. just because there's a good outcome doesn't mean that the, the way you got there was OK. So I don't I think he should was, have I ever wonder, sent a single Spaniard to fight for Nazis under any circumstances. I, wonder, I don't think that was OK. I kind of wonder if there was blackmail going on with that or. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like I said, the, invasion. There, that's exactly, there, that's exactly it. there could be a lot more at, at stake that I'm just not uh, aware of or. or have ever experienced so i couldn't begin to understand i'll i'll grant that but on the whole at the thirty thousand foot view i i it feels like franco did a lot of compromising to just find his way through a terrible situation and that's part of what i don't like about him uh by the way don franco good morning to you uh what is he he says something here jake jake it's admirable that you love English history, but it's not the but not the country it was. Unfortunately, 100%. the nation needs to reconsecrate itself to Our Lady of Walsingham to yes. return to its former glory in faith. Yes, uh, Our yeah. Lady where's of the lie? We where's need to bring the back the serum right. We need to. Uh, it's ah, funny you bring that up. We were talking ordinary, about that. Come on. Oh. I was talking about that with Father Rock from Ask a Priest Live Fame uh, on uh, on Easter Vigil night. And um, we were talking about that very thing, you know, just the whole Anglican ordinariate having a uh, like a weird book of common prayer type of liturgy that's been amalgamated into a Latin mass or not even Latin, Latin rite mass just feels strange. And, you know, Margaret Clitheroe, St. Edmund Campion, Thomas More, John Fisher, any of the great martyrs of the English period – they just wouldn't understand. Like they, like they, they would walk in there and go, "What are we doing? <laughs> Why are we doing this?" The serum rite would yeah, have been the Angl- what they would have been most used to. The Anglican ordinary is not traditional. It's it's not Novus Ordo. It's its own thing. And mm-hmm. I I would like to think that in you know the the church has men who could reconstruct the serum rite. I'm sure they've got enough records to do it. I don't know why that wasn't the go to. 
But oh, I think they knew. Up. They just this was a choice. Now, uh, this is this is you know. I mean, everyone loves. I I'll admit it. I bought the Walsingham Publishing um, KJV with uh, with the Catholic books in in the proper order. Like, just it's gorgeous English. Like, it, it, there's something wonderful about that. I I love that. But like w- the the true restoration of of English, you know, Catholic heritage is the mass that all the English martyrs died for, you know? Right, exactly. <laughs> all those priest hiding holes that they built and secret liturgies being said in houses and homes and holes and what all, all the rest, none of which were in English. The Serum Rite is not the traditional Latin mass that we go to, like the 62 Missal or the 55 or whatever. It was different but similar. It was much more similar to the TLM was, that we it would was go almost, to. It was almost identical. Dissimilar. There were little customary differences, kind of like if anyone's ever been to a Dominican Rite or a TLM exactly, or whatever. Yeah. There's some little differences here and there, but the right, structure yeah. of it is the same. Structures there. They would yeah. feel far more familiar with the 62 Missal TLM than yeah. they would in the Novus Ordo or or in uh, what the Anglican Ordinariate has today. Yes. That doesn't mean that what they're doing today isn't reverent or intentional, you know, or even beautiful. There's certainly sure. elements to that there, a lot uh, of to be sure. English and stems, I yeah. would take it over a Nova Shore to almost every day of the week. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, uh, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it just seems a little bipolar, it's, doesn't it's, it? E- like, it's equally inauthentic mm-hmm. to the Nova Shore. Like, like it's, it's, a, it's a modern... Right, that's kind of patched together out of bits and pieces from other other things. It's it's not uh, and it's not really a you know something with true apostolic heritage in that way. And that's mm. a, this is, this is a hot take for you in the area you're in because aren't you in kind of like one of the better areas to find an, an Anglican ordinary at mass? Like I'm in the I'm in the home office. Yep. It's uh, yeah. yeah the the home office is right. I mean, I, I have I have a history with all of those people actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been I worked with them for a decade. In fact, sitting on my shelf, like it's right around here someplace. I forget where I put it actually. Uh, Monsignor Steenson, before they got Bishop Lopes, Monsignor Steenson ran the Anglican Ordinary here in the United States. He was a married English bishop. Uh, he uh, he was American Episcopalian, married uh, bishop, and he came into the Catholic faith. So they ordained him and made him a monsignor. If you're married, you can never be a bishop. But he could be a monsignor. And during certain liturgies, he wore the mitre and they had the crozier, actually. Uh, but he knew, he knew that they needed uh, a proper bishop. So he requested from the Vatican that they send a proper bishop a consecrated proper bishop for the Anglican Ordinariate. He eventually got what he wanted. But I have a poster he gave me. Um, I forget what I did with that thing, though. It's like it was sitting right here. It's a long poster that he's a patristic scholar. He was teaching at the seminary as his full-time job, and he was doing the uh, the, the bishop stuff for the Anglican Ordinariate on the side. And uh, he gave me this poster that charts all of the early church fathers, the times that they lived and the works that they wrote. It's a It's an incredible chart, like seven foot long, I got it sitting right here somewhere. Anyway, he gave that to me. When he, when they finally got Lopes, he he left. He retired to Minnesota to be around his grandkids. He was a good man, and he had good intentions. But it, at the end of the day, Lopes, Lopes had zero. The only thing Lopes had in common with the Anglican Ordinary was he was a part of the dicastery at the Vatican that helped to bring about the liturgy. He had no experience with the Anglicans, Episcopalians or otherwise. He's from California. His name is Lopes, you know, like an Anglicanized version of Lopez, for instance. Um, he's a, Lopez, Lopes is a good man. Don't get me wrong. I, mm. I have had good experiences with him, personal conversations with him. He's a good man, but he's trying to keep his head down. He's trying to not cause a lot of attention, not raise any real <coughs> waves. He's just trying to keep floating down that, 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 that that river, so to speak. But the whole thing is a little strange in the sense that you have the all these communities coming over to Rome from these Episcopalian uh, uh, congregations, and they all wanted to come to, to, to be Catholic again, but they didn't want to lose their Anglican liturgy. And that was the crux. And the Vatican was happy to give them that aspect instead of saying hold on you want to come back to the you want to come back to the church is it for the right reasons if it's for the right reasons then guess what you need to 
you should return to your tradition. You should you should go back to the point you stepped off. And that's exactly what they didn't do. So it was it's been building since the eighties under JP too. Um I'm just looking at some of these comments. By the way, 99% say they don't think euthanasia should be allowed. 1% say yes. So we're still we're still at 1%. We're going to have to say goodbye here in a little bit, but mm-hmm. we're still at 1%. Uh, somebody thinks that euthanasia, doctor or physician-assisted suicide, thinks is it should be okay. That is absolutely bizarre. I can't understand it. Is that within the, might be within the margin of error, accidental clicks? You know? <laughs> it might be. I don't know. Uh, Jamie asked the question, how is keeping prayer not for the right reason? Uh, okay. That's a good question. And I should, I should, I should characterize my statement by saying, I, I have no ill will towards, uh, the, the Anglicans that have come back to the church, praise be to God, or the communities that have arisen, most of which aren't former Anglicans anymore. Uh, many Catholics are, are that were never Anglican or Episcopalian are part of these communities now. And they're beautiful. Uh, lots of, uh, growing budding young families. All of that is good. But here's what I mean. They were Anglican Episcopalians and they want to come to the Catholic faith. So the, the priest and all the, the, the con- congregation decided they'd come together. They appealed to Rome, JP2. JP2 gave them a personal preference and said, okay, come on by. And because you're coming as a congregation, we're going to take your pastor and we're going to uh, ordain them a Catholic priest, and that way you can keep some something that feels familiar. It's not like really rocking the boat or whatever, not changing everything up. So that's what they did. And so, so, the, so these men had to go through like a small uh, seminary type of formation to sort of ensure that their philosophy or theology was okay. Then they ordained these men. But they all knew that that wasn't going to be good enough for the long haul. And so eventually what we get is the Anglican Ordinariate which is a good thing. But it's, again, St. Edmund Campion, St. Margaret Clitheroe, St. John Fisher, St. Thomas More, and the myriad of English martyrs who were drawn and quartered, tortured, starved to death, hunted down. None of them would like what they see today in the liturgy. They would all feel like it's like it, you've sold out to the common book of prayers. This is Queen Elizabeth and Henry VIII we're seeing here. None of them would understand what, what that was. So if you're returning to the faith because you believe it's the one true holy Catholic and apostolic faith, the only church through which salvation enters the world, then you should do that for the right reasons, right? You should come back to the faith. Let the chips fall where they may. So many Protestant pastors, you know, are, are, they, they will come to the knowledge that the Catholic church is the true church, but then they have a decision to make. Do they give up their job? their livelihood, their friends, their family, their popularity, their fame, their fortune, to wa- walk away from all of it, to become Catholic? I, I, Those... I couldn't help but be reminded of, of when Andrew Clavin told, uh, told, went, on to, went on and told his show and told people the straight face that God doesn't want Ben Shapiro to become I know. Catholic because that Absolutely. would cost Ben Shapiro too much money. <laughs> I was like, yeah. what? <laughs> That's the first thing I thought about, and I, I did. I talked about that last week on the show. Every, but every yeah, convert has... Hor- Every adult convert has horror stories to tell you about what happens when they become yeah. Catholic. Every single one. The reality is, <laughs> to those who are given much, much is expected, and those that would deny me before uh, before people, their friends, their family, uh, he will deny them before God the Father. So I think the best thing for the Anglican Ordinary, and, and because I've talked to some inside sources, I'm not going to say who or what or when, but I've talked to some some clergy within... The ordinariate. There was a movement afoot going more traditional, actually saying traditional Latin masses and teaching others to do so as well, until for until Traditionus Casotis came out and the hammer fell. That got that was one of the things that got quietly uh, squashed at the uh, at the ordinariate was that there was yeah, there a, gonna, there was there a, was talk, a there tendency was to restore the Right, the TLM they, or the serum. There were some serum rights, well, some some attempts to restore the serum right. Based on the it might the be the serum right, but what I was told was the TLM. So maybe there's just a mixing up of terms. I don't know. I can't say. But well, either way, if what that would have been Francis better. Is a moderate. You might if if what falls Francis is a moderate. You may get um, the most egregious things Francis done being rescinded in some way. 
but a moderate's unlikely to rescind anything because that's not really a moderate thing to do. But you might get, you know, fiducia supplicants, amoris laetitia, and traditionalis custodis undone. Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Hey, female Casey Royals fan from Nebraska. Good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Glad you're here. Appreciate seeing you here. Mac Thompson, good morning to you. Glad to see you guys here. Praise be to Jesus. KSB, good morning to you. I also like the TLM because that there's no sign of peace. I'm, I'm so <laughs> discouraged by the, the peace signs and the chat during during the mass. Yes. Um, I always called it the high five your neighbor part because yeah, like, it's awkward. It ain't, well, it is, well, it's it's also not just like the way you're supposed to do it, which is the person in front of you and the person to each side of you. It turns into people like leaning over pews and doing things you can just wait for holy donut hour for yeah i've you know i even when i was in those days in the middle of all i felt it was awkward then it's just like we interrupt this sacred liturgy to give you glad handing <laughs> you know and it's just like there's no and there's no limit to it you know i feel similar to even like uh one of my big criticisms of the church lot mass uh and in this is also true at the anglican ordinariate you know, where like you end the liturgy of the word and you're in this, you're, you're in a, a, like a pause, you're in a gray zone between liturgy of the word and liturgy of the Eucharist and this gray zone where it gets very, you know, like, Hey, and here's the latest announcements. You know, it's like, I don't like that. It well, takes me straight of, out of where a, I was. A lot of traditional, a lot of traditional priests will not give the announcements at all until after the mass. If there's any yeah. announcements to be made, they lay reserve it for after the mass. Like it's, you're seeing that more with younger traditional priests who I will, a lot of people don't like this when I point this out, but most of the young FSSP priests I've spoken with, they're like talking to SSPX priests. And that freaks a lot of people out <laughs> when you point that out to them. But they're hard, you know, they're, they tend to be harder line. And you may see that practice go away. It could very yeah. well be that the liturgy of the word is just the, the readings in the vernacular followed by the homily. And unless it's like a real ground shaking kind of thing, like I could, I could forgive a priest saying, look, we're under tornado warning right now. So if the sirens go off, you can either stay here for masks. I'll keep offering it. Or you can go to the shelter that's in the basement. I won't hold it against you if you do that. Yeah, sure. But otherwise, you know, you know, beyond that, like, I, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, I, I mean, don't know. Technically, I've always, technically I've always the, felt it was the weird. sermon isn't part of the mass. I know. That's why I said it's a gray zone. That's why I said that. It is a gray zone. Technically speaking, it's a gray zone. I get that. I understand. But it still just sort of sucks you out psychologically from where you were, right? At Hebrews chapter 12, you're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Your heaven and earth are touching. And you're like, by the way, this coming Saturday is a potluck. You know, hey, any anniversaries here today? Any birthdays? Anyone? Anyone? It's like, oh. Why are we did, doing did this? Do TLM priests do that? I've never seen TLM priests do that. No, that's an Anglican ordinary okay. thing. Yeah, <laughs> we're, we're literally in the middle of the most solemn thing you could ever be doing. And by the way, there, there, there's a, you know, there's donuts in the refectory after the mass. Yeah, exactly. you know? yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you know. right. Like, like I'm not opposed to the social time. Like, that's good. That's, these are good things. But like, for maybe right at the end or is something. There, is there I don't something know. about how um, sermons or homilies uh, were were done, like after mass or anything like that? Um, has that always been the place to preach is at the, is, you know, after the reading of the gospel? Good question. I don't I, know. I, I need to look into that because I, f- I feel like I remember reading something like that, but I'm not sure. And historically, like you would have actually just had the mass going all the way through, no translations, no nothing. You would have just mm. done the whole, the, would have been the holy sacrifice of the mass all the way through and then the extra stuff after. I, I feel like I remember reading that somewhere, but I could be totally wrong. So I'll have to look that up. Ginger gal says women wear jeans for Easter mass. Well, there's some dudes that also dress t- terribly as well. I'm going to be honest with you. Okay. Some flip flops, some shorts and t-shirts and all the rest. Yeah, you don't, you don't have to you don't have be wearing three piece suits. You, know, you don't have to. Have I told you my, but. my way other people dress at mass horror story? No. <laughs> it was one of the things that radicalized me. <laughs> no. I used to go to daily mass at the parish that was found itself a, that, that had been there for almost a century before a university was built up around it. And so there you had this Catholic parish in the middle of downtown Portland, surrounded by all these par- surrounded by this university. And I'd go to daily mass there. And for whatever reason, there was a young woman who would wear yoga pants who would sit in the pew right in front of me and start uh, praying. It's the worst. Yeah, no, yeah, no, you, it is. 
no, what was even worse about it was when she brought her boyfriend once. I was like, uh, I just wanted to like slap the guy. I'm like, come on, man. We gotta like, <laughs> like, yeah, you know. Oh man, you gotta have a, I, I, a mutual respect conversation there. Golly gee whiz, what is? Uh, I don't understand you, ladies. I like, really, really. I, I'm don't. the guy who goes. I go to the gym in the middle of the night, so I don't have to deal with that kind of stuff at the right. gym. A place yeah. where it's more logical that people are going to, if they're going to dress in modestly, you expect it there because it's the gym. I don't want to and see I go it there, there either, to be honest. Like yeah, when you, I whenever either. I travel I in airports, in airports are filled to the brim with ladies wearing yoga pants. Uh, is that com- flying is so uncomfortable? How flying is, is uncomfortable, that so comfortable? To- I don't. I dr- I truly I don't understand women. I don't. I don't get you. There's so many things that you do that is just bizarre to me. High heels. What torture is this? Why would you do this to yourself? It cannot be comfortable. It is the most ridiculous like piece of foot gear I've ever seen. Get rid of it. It's stupid. Just why do this stuff? Yoga I, pants I is not comfortable. No. I will explain. There's a scale, I, and on one side is comfort, mm-hmm. and on the other side is attention. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and guess which one weighs? Guess which one weighs uh, more? Comfort. And men ha- and we men have ways of, and and men have doing this have have our ways of doing the same yes, kind of exactly. thing. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Us yeah, men, 100%. we value well, we value all, the comfort. We're all egomaniacs. Yes, yeah, we're all, we value expert. the comfort and the laziness, and that, and so I don't need to put on a tie. You know, I don't. Need I to do just, that. I, uh, you know, exactly. I just so. don't get the yoga <laughs> pants though. They can't be comfortable. They cannot be. I'm sorry, but skin tight clothing I've, I've never is understood. not a comfort yeah. thing. Guess which one weighs more on this? I've scale? never understood it. Ah, oh, unbelievable. <laughs> and I do yeah. have to run. I've got another engagement in the next yeah, couple we of weeks. Yeah, God bless you, Dr. Stein. Thanks for, Thanks for hanging out with us the, today. No Appreciate uh, the conversation going in all kinds of crazy ways. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this part of the fun of it. Hey, yeah. do us a favor, though. Uh, yeah. Share us share us right now if you can, like wherever you're watching right now. Hit the share button. That would be incredibly helpful to us. Uh, praise be to God. We'll hopefully um, we'll have you back soon, Dr. Stein. Thanks for again for your time and for all that you're doing to cover these stories and uh, stories that don't get covered very often. On uh, on the YouTube's, so we appreciate you. He's gone. All right. Yeah, yeah. I, I think we're us. gonna go too. <laughs> I think. We are. Um, have a great day, Jets, Flying Tigers. I think he meant gents, but Jets. I like as a New York Jets. Jets. Well, he's a you're flying. A, he's a flying tiger. So maybe Rob, he's... you're not a you're not a Jets fan, are you? Well, he, he How, looks... When's the last time the Jets did anything well? When like Namath was the quarterback, or like I think he's just talking to fellow planes because he's clearly a P forty Warhawk. Is he? Well, Clearly. I mean, look, at his, <laughs> look at his profile picture. Look at Flying Tigers' could, profile picture. Oh, you meant Jets. He, he okay. meant, Sorry, Flying Jets. Tigers. I knew what he meant. <laughs> Mark, Mark, good morning to you. I was taking you at face value. Blue jeans, dress shirt, tie, jacket are dressed up. Well, I can see blue jeans being dressed up. I can see that. Especially in the country, sort of giddy up attire, but... But that's not what we meant, was it? Like, that's not what we're talking about. Yeah, that's the issue. Pedro, good morning to you. Maria, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out. Hey, we'll see you guys back here tomorrow to talk about the eclipse. Until then.